why is this me though? Literally, if I have to go into a city with loud people, actually malls are worse. Yeah, but if you just like go shopping and it's like outside, if you have like single stores, also same difference. If I have to go grocery shopping, I'm also need the headphones and maybe sunglasses. People will look at you really weirdly, but maybe also sunglasses because the lights are just awful. <laughs> Hello baby queers and welcome back to my channel. Today we're doing some neurodivergent TikToks again, because why the hell not? Either way, you know the deal, before you continue, y'all gotta get hydrated. So grab some water, or some tea, or whatever else you like to drink, and then we'll check out some more TikToks. Are you hydrated? Good. Let's go. If you have ADHD, if you're autistic, if you are otherwise neurodiverse, you may have experienced what I like to call the am I hungry or is the world ending conundrum. Neurodiversity makes it very difficult to detect hunger cues for some people. A hunger cue means something that physically occurs within you that lets your brain know we need to eat. Examples include stomach pains, low energy, shakiness, headaches, trouble focusing. And the reason that ADHD and neurodiversity makes discerning true hunger cues so difficult is that a day where I'm shaky, low energy, having trouble focusing, having weird stomach problems, and generally having a headache is just a regular Tuesday for me. That is how I exist with ADHD. When you add forgetfulness and PTSD into the mix, it becomes nearly impossible to remember when the last time you ate was, if you ate something nutritional or actually filling, if you've been hydrating. For example, I was supposed to eat this at 12 p.m. It's currently 5.41. Between 12 and 5, I have gotten progressively more irritable, lower energy. My ability to stay on task with what I'm currently working on has decreased, even though I am medicated today. Around 4.50, I had finally the cognitive realization, hey, you probably need to eat. That wasn't because my body actually communicated to my brain a hunger cue and I successfully received and acted upon it. It's because I've lived with ADHD for 24 years and I know this drill. This is not my first rodeo. When you're hungry and you haven't yet realized that you're hungry and that's what's contributing to the already underlying issues of your disability, small regular stressors turn into these massive problems that feel like the world is ending. So when I notice that I'm having a the world is ending level of frustration reaction to an everyday stressor, I go, oh, hunger cue, I need to eat. I guess hunger cues do work a little bit differently because the normal hunger cues of oh yeah my stomach's empty and it's growling I need to eat because for a lot of us it's kind of difficult to tell exactly what our body is telling us like even if we notice okay my stomach feels weird it's kind of hard to pinpoint exactly what that feeling is and it seems so weird to other people because I, you just know if you're hungry and it's like bro I don't know if my stomach hurts because the muscles are far from working out I don't know if my stomach just hurts because it's like reacting to something. I don't know if I'm hungry. And then you have to play the game of why Why is my stomach hurting? When is the last time I've eaten? Was I maybe like, you know, if you like maybe have lactose intolerance and you have to consider, wait, did I have like coffee with milk in it? Or did I, did I eat something with milk in it? You kind of have to play the game. Or just waiting until you're so irritable that you're so stressed and done that making food is nearly impossible which doesn't help but um i feel like a lot of us do it too often um which is why if i think my stomach is like growling even if i can't tell if i'm actually hungry if it's just like weird i just try to eat something you know just like grab a snack or something to see if that does anything or if it makes it worse. Because usually it helps. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm losing interest in what I'm doing. I feel like we've all been there. Like sometimes you start doing something and you're so excited to reorganize the entire kitchen that you reorganize the entire kitchen and then continue sorting everything in your house or apartment. But sometimes you have all the pots out and you're just like, no, no, don't do this to me because your brain's suddenly like, no, I'm tired. We're not doing it. And then you, you made it even like a bigger mess, you know, because maybe everything was in the closets or like in the cabinets and you just, you didn't like the way it was sorted into the cabinet. So you decided to resort it. Or maybe that was just like a few things that didn't fit, so you need to resort it. Bro, we've all been there. And the whole, oh yeah, just push through it. 
you know, just finish what you started. While from the outside, it just looks like we're lazy and don't want to finish it because we would rather like doom scroll through our phone or something. Um, it looks a lot different on the inside where you're literally having to fight your brain to continue and sometimes you just lose. <laughs> With ADHD don't fall asleep they pass out and that is so important to understand about yourself if you have ADHD but also if you have children that have ADHD because it means you have to break all the bedtime rules all the rules that we've been taught about bedtime because it what works for a neurotypical child surprise surprise doesn't work for the ADHD child and so what that means is instead of bath time bed like being all calm and relaxed first of all let them bounce, let them get all the energy out, let them run around, let them do all the things. Don't expect them to kind of slowly down into sleep because what they're doing is going boink straight into sleep. So first of all, let them burn off the energy. And then second, give their brain something to focus on whilst they're falling asleep, passing out. So that might mean that you break the rule and you give them a tablet at bedtime or they have a TV in their bedroom. We find that brown noise really helps and stories never bloody worked. They've never worked. ADHD and neurotypical brains work in complete opposite forms. And truly, if you struggle to get your ADHD child to bed, change it, change all the rules and do something different. And this way might help bedtime be a bit more manageable and get them to sleep a bit earlier. So yeah, hope that helps. Take care. Bye. I love the, if you have neuro, like neurodiverse children, or if you're just ADHD yourself, because yeah, the amount of times I've tried doing nighttime routines, I mean, A, keeping the routines is a nightmare because for a week I'll be super excited about it and maybe do it. And then I keep forgetting steps. And then I'm just mad at the entire thing. And then I'm also just so focused on doing that and like trying to relax that I can never possibly relax. And yeah, no, it doesn't help. I, I've never managed to stick to it and it didn't actually help me fall asleep easier. The whole, oh yeah, take a warm shower or, you know, no screens before bed, you know, or like drinking a warm tea. It really bloody doesn't help. Um... But yeah, listen, if something doesn't work in general, I don't even care what it is. If something isn't working for you or for your family or for your kids, just try something different. I know at first it seems counterproductive to be like, okay, let them just like run around or jump around on a trampoline before going to bed. But listen... If that doesn't help either, you can like go back to trying different things, but maybe just trying the complete opposite or just anything different is generally kind of a good approach because if something isn't working, why would you keep trying that same thing in hopes that it will one day work? Because no, that's that's not going to happen. Sending TikToks as a love language when you're also neurodivergent is such a trippy experience. Like sometimes I'm sending you something because I found it relatable. Sometimes I'm sending you something because I thought that seemed like us. Uh, sometimes I'm sending you something because it seemed like you. Sometimes I'm just sending you something that I found that was cool. And I'm expecting you to know the difference. But here's the cool part. If you're one of those few people that I can be either fully or very unmasked around, I don't even have to worry because I know you'll get it. I love how all of us have just gone over to sending memes or funny videos or TikToks or Instagram reels or whatever it is as a kind of love language and showing that the other person that we're thinking of them because texting in and of itself, I feel like especially to a lot of ADHD people, is kind of boring sometimes because if like nothing really super different or interesting happened during the day you have so many thoughts but they're just like gone the minute you're not thinking about it anymore so just writing hey how was your day was work okay boring cannot do it will not do it but sending someone a tiktok that is one of these categories of okay you either thought it was relatable to you you either thought it was relatable to them or that it was like 
to present your dynamic or something or just because you thought it was cool and the other person would like it. It doesn't matter. But I love that we're all doing it. Because I would I would I would not know how to be friends with someone if they're like, okay, can you like not send me TikToks all the time? Like you send me like five TikToks a day. I cannot I I would not know how to react because how how else would I would I show you that I'm thinking of you? Because I'm thinking of you and I wanted to entertain you. It's okay if you don't have time and don't watch them because Listen, we all got busy. We all have those days or weeks or months. So, you know, but just doing it is honestly great and I couldn't do without it. <laughs> this is precisely why I used to not wear hoodies. I, I literally couldn't wear hoodies when I was a child. It took so long. Because if you don't know, you're not a legend. And if you have a difficult time recognizing symptom uh, signals from your body, then recognizing that you're so agitated because you keep feeling like you're being choked by your hoodie, then it's kind of difficult to wear hoodies. Because if you don't know, you don't know. And then you're just like in a bad mood constantly and you feel like you're choking. But then you don't even really notice sometimes. And then you're just in a constant bad mood. And it just kind of sucks, so now you just do this all the time. And that's why I will usually have my sleeves out, because that's like nothing worse for me, really, than having, like, sleeves on my wrists. That is so annoying. Will not do it. Like, if the sleeves are longer, so I can, like, kind of pull them up my hands, it's kind of fine. I will only have my sleeves down if I'm really, really cold, because in that case, being a little bit warmer kind of beats... The feeling of, ew, it's on my wrist. It's kind of a fine line, really. But a hoodie on my neck? Jesus, no. <laughs> neurotypicals think the autistics are giving them attitude when we ask questions because neurotypicals don't use questions as a form of information gathering. Neurotypicals half the time are using questions as a form of judgment or beratement. It's a form of disrespect because that's how they are using the questions. Y'all know the question, why are you doing it like that? Or why did you do it like that? So, when an autistic person is asking that question, it is a question. We are expecting an answer. I would like to know more about your process. And so, when an autistic is asked that question, I am going to explain my process to you. Because you just asked me a question, so I'm expecting you want, I'm imagining you want the answer, right? Now, when a neurotypical person is asking, why are you doing it that way? They're not looking for an answer. They're not actually asking a question. It is rhetorical. What they're doing is they are saying, I don't like the way you did that, and I am mad at you. I don't know why they can't just say, I don't like that, or they can't just say, like, anything else, but they ask it. They ask it, and then you ask me the question, I will answer you, and then they say, hit you with the, I don't want your excuses. Then why did you ask, right? But they're not really asking. They're berating you. And so, when an autistic person brings the same question to a neurotypical, they think they are being berated and judged and talked down to. And then they get mad at us, as if we're the ones bringing attitude into the conversation. I don't get it, and I know a lot of other people don't, because we all know that neurotypicals have just communication deficits, honestly. They say we're the ones with the problems, I mean, it's been proven time and time again that autistic to autistic communication works really well. Neurotypical to neurotypical communication usually works pretty well. Neurotypical and autistics trying to communicate, that's kind of where it falls apart because of things like these. Like, if you're asking me a question, I will give you an answer. I, I, will, I will just answer the question. Because even though I do think your tone might be pissy, I'm just going to assume that you're pissed because you either don't like the outcome of the way I did it and you're trying to understand why it didn't work or why it didn't bring the result you wanted. So I'm going to explain what I did or why I did it so we can work on a solution. But you will always get the, yeah, don't give me your excuses. And I was like, bro, I'm just, I'm just trying to explain. Because it made sense for me to do it like this. That's why I did it like this. Listen. 
especially if it's like in a job situation or something, if you want it done a specific way, then say that. But usually they won't and either let you figure it out and then be more mad at you or, you know, listen, I do think humans in general tend to have communication issues, but I feel like, I feel like not saying the thing you actually mean is a really big part of it and neurotypicals are very good at that. Someone tells me autism isn't a disability, it's a superpower. I just imagine a bunch of superheroes getting together being like, I can contribute to the team with my super strength. Well, I can contribute because I have invisibility. And I'm just sitting there like, I'm autistic and I miss social cues. Also, when I tried to live completely on my own, I had to go to the hospital multiple times and almost died. But I can tell you a lot of cool facts about insects because I've been learning about them since I was three. Like, oh, this is actually cool. So this is the atlas moth, which is the largest moth in the world, at least by mass. Uh, the white wish moth has a longer wingspan, but their wings are thinner. But it can mimic a snake. Not only just the look, because the tips mimic the look of a snake, they also mimic the movement. So when predators come, they'll drop to the ground and lift up the tips of the wings and start waving them around like a snake, which is pretty cool. Although the shape is a little abstract for me, it's apparently quite effective for predators. It's pretty cool. But... Yeah. I did not actually mean to info dump, but great superpower. That was sarcasm. It is not a great superpower. It is a disability. Like I almost get why people are saying it, but it's so stupid because autistic people know it's a disability and know that they have regions where they struggle and yeah sometimes it might seem difficult to try to find like positive things that come from from autism but usually autistic people will also know where their strengths are and you know what works for them and what doesn't and then usually the one who bring in the shame or even make the autistic people feel shame about their autism, is neurotypicals that will like tell you off for being rude or just try to shame you for having communication difference, like differences or whatever it is. And just like try to shame you for acting weird or keep telling you to not do, cer do certain things like stimming in public or shit like that. And they're the ones who bring the shame. And then a few of them, being sort of aware of that, want to be like, oh yeah, no, but it's it's okay that you're autistic. It's a superpower. Like, it, it kind of isn't. It's just a difference in how our brains work. It's, it's, it's just a neurological difference. You know? And it means we're a little bit different, but it doesn't mean we're worse or better than neurotypicals. But you want to try to, f like, kind of force it and be, like, really positive about it. And it's, I kind of appreciate it, but it's also really weird. Like, your heart was in the right place, but your words really aren't, I guess. <laughs> I was not aware people have like activity bracelets but honestly that is really cool that is really cool why do I not have activity bracelets okay because I hate wearing bracelets but I feel like it would maybe help me do things because again I don't like shirts on my wrists and I still don't know like when I was a teenager I used to wear like leather bracelets a lot I don't know how I could stand that I don't know what I was thinking because I always had my shirts up. I never liked having my shirts on, but then I was wearing bracelets. I don't get it. Listen, and it doesn't make sense to me. But it would probably help me accomplish things because I'm just like so annoyed. And I was like, okay, fold the laundry. Okay, we have to do this so we can have like one less bracelet. And then it would probably help. I 
kind of really want to suggest this to my to my partner because we live together and it would be really cool because we're both neurodivergent and we both kind of struggle to do certain things regularly and I have a magnetic whiteboard right next to me and I feel like if you just put all of the bracelets up and then move them to the done section you know so like when you have a little bit of time or something or you you want to get something done you just like grab bracelets and put them on and then you put them in the done section i i want to suggest it i have to send her this tiktok because then then we can make bracelets i feel like we're gonna spend so much time making these bracelets and then we're gonna use them for two days and then never use them again but I'm kind of willing to take that risk because I feel like, especially like plastic beads or, or something like this, would maybe not be the most expensive thing. And we both kind of like making things. I have to send a TikTok. Hang on, then we'll continue. I love having DID because I'm like, I never know what I look like. And then I look in a mirror or my phone screen and I'm like, what the fuck? You're emo. How did these shelves get here? Who put up the FNAF banner? Hatsune Miku? I don't know if I've done my homework or not. I have this whole desk set up to play The Sims, and I haven't had somebody who wants to play The Sims in months. You're emo. Somebody bought a five-foot Snorlax plushie, and now he's just here. My woman? Probably. Why is half of my recently played on Spotify Taylor Swift's discography in order? Who's gonna be the one to fill up this gigantic water bottle, and who is the one who drank it all? Am I a man? Sure. Who thought it was a good idea to, with our library card, for the first time check out JoJo's Part 1? I can't watch Bluey without feeling like I'm five years old. Am I non-binary? Yeah, definitely. I get. No. Yes? No. Whatever happened to my last therapy appointment is none of my business, because I don't remember. I have blue hair and pronouns. Well, you definitely have blue hair and pronouns. Will your pronouns change? Probably. Will you remember what your pronouns were yesterday? Maybe not. Honestly, I... I can't really relate, but I kind of can, because sometimes I just forget things I've done. Not because I have the ID, just because I, I'm very forgetful. And I do things, and then I, I never remember again. But not to this extent, I guess. So there's that. Let's talk about tone indicators. Tone indicators are used by the neurodivergent community and beyond to express intent when writing messages that can be interpreted different ways. These are shorthand abbreviations used after the phrase signaled with a slash. These can be super helpful not only for autistic folks, but for all of us on the internet, but only if we all know about them. So let's do a quick crash course. Slash J equals joking. Example, that's me as a baby. Slash J. Slash S equals sarcasm. Example, yeah, autism is my superpower. The power to get overstimulated in any environment. Slash S. Slash SRS equals serious. Example, I can't watch TV without subtitles. Slash SRS. Slash POS or slash PC equals positive connotation. Example, I love that for you. Slash POS. Slash NEG or slash NC equals negative connotation. Example, that's horrible. Slash NEG. Slash slash G-E-N or slash G equals genuine. Example, do you recommend self-diagnosing slash gen slash P equals platonic. Example, oh, I love you slash P slash R equals romantic. Example, are you free next weekend for a date slash R slash NM equals not mad. Example, you can't put up a Christmas tree yet slash NM slash RH or slash RT equals rhetorical question. Example, do they think we aren't people? Slash RH. Slash LY equals lyrics. Example, where are you? Slash LY. Honestly, when I came across this TikTok, I had never heard about this before. But honestly, I kind of wish people had like tone indicators in real life because then you might know. <laughs> because I feel like, especially the rhetorical question one, can be kind of tricky or sarcasm because 
as much as all of us use sarcasm, it's a lot harder to tell in some people. Because I can never tell. Because some people just change their mind so often. Or it seems like they do, because you never know which is sarcasm and which isn't. It's really difficult. So honestly, tone indicators are very cool. Did I completely forget that I saved this TikTok and have not mentioned tonic indicators to anyone and asked if we could use them? Definitely, yes. Will I keep forgetting about it? Also, maybe yes. But maybe you're less forgetful and maybe it could help you. <laughs> this is the superior spoon. It's, it's the best spoon. If you get it, you get it. And if you don't, you don't. And if this one's gone, the backup is the plastic spoon. I, I, I wash them and like reuse them. Like I'm not just like throwing away a bunch of plastic spoons. This is the backup. Then this spoon is is okay. If those are gone, like this one's okay. It, it's it's just a little big, you know? And then if those are gone, the baby spoon with my name on it. <laughs> and then this is a bad spoon. It's heavy, okay? It, it, it's a bad spoon. The size is good, but bad spoon. This is the worst of the worst spoons. It's heavy and it's big. Why would anybody want to use this? I have to like hold it with my whole hand. And then, this is my um, cereal spoon because you know, it can, it can get like the, the milk and the stuff, yeah. Honestly, do you have any idea how worried I was that when I ordered new cutlery online that it was gonna have like a weird shape or be like too heavy or too light? I was so worried, but I got so lucky. Because I have like big spoons and I have little spoons. <laughs> what I do need though is like more plastic spoons because I, I don't really like eating cereal with metal spoons, it feels wrong, and I don't have enough plastic spoons, they're constantly, like, gone. So I need more plastic spoons. But yeah, if you get it, you get it, and if you don't, you don't, and you probably think it's really weird, but... It's just, this is, this is the way it works. Are you ready to leave? Yeah. Do you have everything? Mm hmm Do you have your phone? Oh, shit. Do you have your keys? What about your sunglasses? Oh my god. Okay, okay, are you ready to go? I think so. Do you have everything? I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else just like teach themselves when they were very young to just like always check every five minutes if you have everything. Like, the amount of times a day. Like, obviously also before leaving the house, but also just, like, when I'm out and about to make sure I didn't lose anything. To kind of make the, like, pocket check. Which is like, okay, I have my phone in this pocket, I have my wallet in this, I have my keys in my jacket. Okay, that's still there. My sunglasses are still there. Just so often. And so randomly. Sometimes I don't even notice I'm doing it. People are like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, what? <laughs> But yeah, just constantly. But yeah, having someone who asks you if you have everything is also great. <laughs> I wanted to ask what the Amazon Prime video. What about? The, no, the Prime video. Is it Amazon? Yeah, it is Amazon. Um, I feel like you're trying to ask something, but you're not getting there. I'm not broken. I am glitching. The password! <laughs> Why are you recording me? <laughs> so, it was not You know, it's your native language. But you lose the words. They're there, somewhere, flying around. Like, a little bit... Like, you can't catch them. They're there, you know it's there, you just you can't say it. 
And it doesn't help learning more languages because then you forget them in every language or even if you know a second language. Like a lot of people don't know English or don't speak English well. So sometimes when I say something, they'll look at me really weird because I don't understand what I'm saying because I can't remember what I'm saying in German or like what I want to say in German and then I have to say it in English. And then they look at me weird and I'm just like... Yeah. And the whole running around saying like a password out loud or like saying like if you have to type in a pin somewhere because it's like a one-time pin that you get like or get a text message. Saying it out loud until you have to type it in is the only way to get it right, okay? <laughs> it's one way you can tell I live in a neuro-spicy household. Eldest child, autistic, partner, ADHD. <laughs> Okay, but it's just weird if people don't do this. Like, 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 how do you, how do you not, not just like say random things or make random noises or just like repeat stuff? Because sometimes you just repeat a phrase back that someone just said on TV or in a movie you're watching. They're just like automatically. And people either look at you weird or they get it. But again, the neurotypical people maybe not get it and will look at you and think, why did you repeat that? Or why did you make that noise? I don't know, just, it just happens really. You just have to. That's, that's, that's communication at its finest, really. Come on. <laughs> I think I'm losing steam. I'm pretty sure it's PDA kicking in. Okay, come here. It's ready. What's ready? Just come here. It's ready. Okay, that's really cool. It wouldn't work in a lot of cases for me because I kind of, like with my partner or something, I would know they're like joking or like not joking. They're just saying it because they want to rile me up and make me finish. And that wouldn't work because my brain's like, <laughs> yeah, I know you're not saying that seriously. Like, I know you're not serious. And then it doesn't work. I'm really glad it works for you because that's just that's just cool. Then your partner can always just like, you, you never finish anything anyways. And then you just like finish it. You know? Yeah. I'm kind of glad it works. And also it looks really cool. So good job, man. <laughs> oh, you're exhausted? Have you tried doing more tasks? This is why traditional self-care does not work for autistic people. Or at least why it doesn't work for me. So much of holistic self-care is just more stuff you have to put on your plate. Like taking a shower or a bath or, or doing skincare, cooking yourself a nice meal or exercising. And while those things can be nice, for someone in autistic burnout, they seem impossible. And they can often leave you feeling worse than when you started. This is why we need rot days. Give us our rot days. Doing nothing is a necessity. I remember being told so much as a kid that I isolated too much and that I struggled with self-isolation. I would feel so much better if I could go out and be with people. But that was my main way of self-regulation, especially after being at school all day. Same with wanting to listen to like sad or angry music. And this might just be because my parents were very conservative Christian, but I was told a lot that I just needed to listen to more positive songs and watch more positive shows. But my special interests involved a lot of shows and music that weren't very PG and also being so heavily dissociated all of the time. I needed an outlet to feel those emotions that I was bottling up and masking. And engaging with media like that allowed me to finally release it. At the end of the day, find self-care that works for you because it's going to look different for everybody. Yeah, they have a point. Because... A, doing things that just make you feel more stressed, that just feel like chores, that are supposed to make you feel better, but it just takes so much effort for you to actually do it. It really doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. Doing something, because yeah, maybe you really like taking a bath. Then, actually, 
doing it when it feels natural to you. Like, because then if you force yourself to try to have a bath, even if you know you technically enjoy it, it's also not going to help. But if you just do it, because in that moment, it just feels natural because you're just like, okay, I feel like shit, I, I want to right now. Then honestly, just do it. I, I don't care that it's the middle of the day and people are supposed to have baths in the evening or something. Listen, if it feels natural for you and you know it and like you feel better in that moment, if you can do it without stressing yourself more, just do it. You know, same with like eating. Honestly, eating if you're like burned out or something can be tricky. But trying to be like, okay, no, but I have to eat something healthy. It has to be like very nutritional. It's kind of rubbish. Like, sure, it might be preferable if you actually eat something that's healthy for you because your body still needs nutrition and vitamins and minerals. But if that's going to stress you more, like if it's just easier for you to eat like fast food or order something or whatever it is, honestly, eating something is better than not eating anything because you're so stressed out about, okay, I need to make this healthy. Honestly, anything is better than nothing really in cases like that. So yeah, find what works for you and don't do things that stress you out more, which I guess is easier said than done. But I think we can all find little things and maybe build on it with time, you know, to kind of figure out what works for us and what doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, that was all the check talks for today. I hope you found them relatable because I've I once again managed to call myself out it's it's fine it's what I do I guess um but yeah, I hope you enjoyed them I hope you're hydrated if not maybe go drink something now and I'll be back in a few days with my next video